while they are swapping the laptops, I can already announce our keynote speaker today, Klaus Dieter Munz from Stuttgart, like me. Um, he's the deputy director of the Institute for Aerodynamics and Gas um, Dynamics and head of the group for numerical methods, so kind of something in between an engineer and a mathematician. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> Good. And from his time in Karlsruhe, he also has some background in neutron physics and reactor technology. But I think today we will see something about what the Institute is doing, different kinds of applications in aerodynamics and gas dynamics. And I would also like to mention they are the biggest user at the supercomputing center in Stuttgart at the HLRS, so always top of the ranking. So we will see how energy is burned in Stuttgart <laughs> with a lot of turbulent flow simulations. So, Miriam, thank you very much for that nice introduction and of course it's a pleasure for me to give here a talk in the precise workshop. Yes, and I will talk a little bit about our research in the last, let's say, 10-15 years about the coupling of heterogeneous subregions. Yes, but first I have an uh, I should switch on, okay. A short overview about the work that is done in the Institute of Aerodynamics and Gas Dynamics. Yes, you see we have a number of different topics and we have large experimental facilities. Yes, you see here some, the laminar wind tunnel or also water channels. And uh, this, uh, the, sho the shockwave tunnel is replaced currently. Yes, and mm, yes, my group is working more in the construction of numerical methods. So you see here in a short overview about the stuff. The Institute of Aerodynamics and Gas Dynamics had about 50 PhD students, so it's an Yes, typical old engineering institute, yes, a more a little bit the old fashion, but we have different groups in the EHG and one group is that numeric research group that I'm leading and currently we have, or I have 15 PhD students and one postdoc. Yes, Andrea Beck is the postdoc. Yeah, some motivation. Yeah, uh, of course we have in numerical simula simulations often different subregions. Yes, and there are two classes of reasons. One is I call that numerical reasons. So we may have small subregions with mesh refinement to get a high resolution. Yes, so we have yes small grid sizes or the order of accuracy varies. Yes, then it would be also possible that in some subregions some terms are important, in other regions we can switch off these terms or we can change the dimension of the simulation. If we have valves and tubes then we can switch from a three-dimensional simulation maybe to a one-dimensional one or what is also interesting is that zonal approach that we calculate in some regions a RAN simulation, a time average simulation with a turbulence model. Yes, and couple that to a time dependent large eddy simulation. Yes, so we have to switch from a steady state solution to a time dependent solution. These are all, yes, let's say numerical approaches. So we want to reduce a computational effort, yes, and then we take the different behavior of the solution and yeah, adapt the corresponding numerical approach or the discretization parameters. But of course, there are maybe also physical reasons. If we have really different physical 
phenomena in different regions, yes. So fluid structure interaction was one thing, or also if we have heat conduction in the wall, that may be interesting to get that interaction with the fluid flow. So what I will tell, I will start, oh, that was a motivation, of course, already. Then I will talk about numerical methods uh, that we use, finite volume and discontinuous colliding schemes, because the coupling is also very strongly based on the ideas on the finite volume and discontinuous colliding approaches. Yes, so that's uh, the third part that I will look to that coupling of heterogeneous regions. So what are the coupling conditions more? Yes, I will show you three examples, uh, 3D, 1D coupling in a hydraul hydraulic flow, uh, conjugate heat transfer, and here we already apply precise, and then I will show a zonal rents LES approach. And then I asked the other group leaders who are working mainly in applications, and they have performed challenging applications in wind energy simulation that was done by Thorsten Lutz. Uh, he is the leader of aerodynamics and uh, aeroacoustics. And also our helicopter group, uh, I will show some simulation of Manuel Kessler. Yes, and of course I will finish with some conclusions. Now, what we look is uh, our approximate solutions, which are piecewise continuous, piecewise polynomials. Yes, so we can represent them in such a way that we have a set of basis fu functions phi. Yes, and the basis functions depend on x, and the coefficients here in that sum are the degrees of freedom or the co coefficients that depend on time. Yes, and these basis functions are locally defined, though they are discontinuous between the grid cells. Why we look for that? Yes, if we have a coarse grid, and that's uh, yes, only a hyperbolic tangent approximated by polynomials, here by piecewise, continuous polynomials and hereby a continuous one. Then the continuous one, we have an unresolved problem, so the continuous approximation gets some oscillations, yes, and if we have those oscillations in a nonlinear hyperbolic problem, then we will get trouble, maybe negative densities or anything else, so they, the amplitudes may increase. If we approximate that by a piecewise continuous one, yes, then you see we allow a discontinuity, but we are then able to avoid the oscillations and to get some monotonous approximation of that monotonous profile. Yes, the problem, of course, is the discontinuity. We need there a consistency approximation, a consistent approximation. Uh, usually the approximation methods are based on Taylor expansions, yes, and then all is fine. But here we have to do, to look how we can approximate uh, such a jump in an appropriate way. And the main idea was that of Godunov, that you really look to a local solution of that. I have here that local solution for a jump from UL to UR. Yes, for the Euler equations, in that case, we have three elementary waves, so the jump breaks down into different waves, and we have four constant states separated by yeah, shock wave or refraction wave, and the intermediate wave is a linearly degenerate wave, a contact discontinuity in which, at which the density jumps, but 
fluid velocity and pressure is constant. Yes, so in, in that situation we have maybe have uh, some, some compressed state here, a higher density and higher pressure, then we have a compression wave to the right and a rarefaction wave to the left. We can solve that problem, yes, by an iterative procedure, yes, and of course that is also an element of a finite volume scheme, and in the last years one found uh, yes, a, a number of good approximation of that nonlinear problem and uh, of the exact solution. So, that's already the direction to the finite volume schemes. Let's look shortly to these schemes or this class of schemes. If we start here in the conservation equation, then this conservation equation is integrated over time and over every grid cell. Let's take QI as a grid cell then we have an integral mean value at the time level Tn plus 1 is given by the integral mean at the old time level Tn minus, and that's a flux balance through the boundary of Qi, so we have the integral over the whole surface, the flux into normal direction, and the integral over time from Tn to Tn plus 1. So that's a problem. We are calculating integral means, but we need the flux at the surface. So the flux at some special or at some points at the surface. Yes, so in the finite volume scheme, we need these three steps. We need a reconstruction. We have to reconstruct local values from the average values, from the means. Yes, of course, piecewise constant would be a very simple one, but that's first order accurate. Then we have to calculate the flux. We have a jump at the boundary, so we have to calculate then the flux or the surface integral of the flux. And then we have to apply that formula for the next time step. Yes, and we already, or I already discussed that part uh, that we can calculate that break up of the jumps into different waves. Yes, and that was the idea of Godunov, that he <coughs> took that solution of the so-called Riemann problem, of the initial value problem for our equations uh, with uh, initial data UL for x smaller, zero and you are for x, x larger zero. Yes, and you can calculate that in such a way and then you take the solution at x equals zero at the initial jump and you integrate then this solution over time, of course. In that case, it's, it, it doesn't, uh, it's, uh, it does not depend on time, so we can directly take the solution at x equals zero. So, I already discussed that we can approximate that to reduce a computational effort, but as long as we assume that we have a piecewise constant approximation, yes, that was the original idea of Godunov, then we are first order accurate in time, in smooth parts of the flow. Yes, so we need a better reconstruction, and I have taken here one with a parabola. Yes, so we want in grid cell I a better representation of our solution. Yes, so we can look, we need a reconstruction, so we look to the neighbors and construct some better approximation Yes, we can take the central one, the green one. Yes, so we have the neighbors to the right and to the left. We can take the, all the neighbors to the right. Yes, that's uh, the three points, xi, xi plus one, xi 
plus two or the neighbors to the left. And then we have three parabola calculated. Yes, and we can take the sum of all the weighted sum here. Yes, so we have then here that expression for our piecewise polynomial or for our polynomial at the grid cell i. Of course, we can optimize the coefficients. If all is smooth, then we can look that we get the highest accuracy. Yes, but we have here a stronger jump. Yes, you see that uh, these parabola have some overshoot and here an undershoot, so we have no monotonous profile here. In that case, the yellow one is much better. Yes, so if you have a larger jump in between the whole stencils, yes, then it would be better to take here the yellow one, so the weight will be larger than the others, and this will avoid the oscillating behavior. That's the idea of the weighted, essentially non-oscillatory schemes. So, if we look to uh, multi-dimensions to unstructured grids, then we see very fast that this is a cumbersome procedure. Yes, here we have uh, yes polynomials of degree two, also again, yes, to get third order accuracy. And then we need here six neighbors or five neighbors together with our central grid cell, yes, to calculate the coefficients of these polynomials. Then we have to look to every direction to take, to cover all directions. Yes, so you have to calculate a lot of polynomials. And you could imagine if we have some irregular grid, then it would be, this would be quite difficult and even it would be not clear if you really get the desired accuracy. And if you look to third, to three space dimension, then that's the number of the needed grid cells around, yes, that you have to take into account uh, to calculate such an interpolation or reconstruction polynomial. So that's a lot of work, and in practical calculation, you often do not observe the desired accuracy. So that's much better in the discontinuous Galerking approach. We start again in that conservation equation. Yes, but now you do not reconstruct your approximate solution to get such a higher degree polynomial, but you calculate that. Yes, so you introduce a weak formulation, a Galerking formulation, you multiply by a test function and integrate over the grid cell QI. Yes, and uh, you take all the test functions to be the basis functions, so you have now a system of equations. Of course, if you have only a constant test function and a constant basis function, then you have here the finite volume scheme. Yes, because the volume integral drops out. But if you have then a piecewise linear or piecewise parabolic approximation, then you have then a system of equations. Now you have again three steps. I have written down that first step, a solu solution of the volume integral. Yes, so that is a lot to calculate, a lot to do. You have that flux calculation and the evaluation of the surface integral, like in the finite volume scheme, but now for every equation, of course. Yes, and then you can calculate the system of equations here, one spec. The system of equations, yes, then you will get directly a new polynomial. 
what we need here, that's the structure of our discontinuous galerging scheme now is that we end up in every grid cell here by some initial value problem. Yes, we have to calculate a volume integral. We have to calculate the surface integrals. And here, of course, we need the values of the neighbors, but only the direct neighbors. That's one advantage. Yes, and the other advantage is that this is quite favorable for the parallel computers, for the modern computers, because you have a lot to calculate by evaluating that volume integral, and during that time you can exchange the data, yes, with the neighbors to get the values from the neighbors, so you have an unlocking uh, transfer of the data. Yes, and uh, yes, you, if you have a high order accuracy, we have seven or eight. Yes, for instance, then you have only one grid cell on every processor and that runs optimal. So that's fine. What we apply is a so-called spectral element, discontinuous scalaricing approach. I will show you that in shortly. So we have hexahedrons, we restrict ourselves to hexahedrons, then we can introduce a tensor product basis. So the tensor product of one-dimensional Lagrangian polynomials at Gauss or gauss lobato points. And uh, the big advantage is that uh, if you choose the same points for integration and interpolation, then a number of terms drop out and you will get a diagonal mass matrix and also in your evaluation of the integrals, uh, yes, one-dimensional operators. Yes, let's look a little bit to that. Uh, of course, what we need is a, yes, a reference hexahedron and we need the transformation of the unstructured grid cells here to that reference element and we allow curved grid cells and we allow also hanging nodes for local refinement. Yes, so it's more, it's, it's not such specialized, you can really handle also complex geometries, but of course a hexahedral grid is always a little bit difficult to generate. Yes, let's look a short to that uh, tensor product. So you see here that reference element in two space dimensions. Yes, you, here we choose the Gauss points for the Lagrangian one-dimensional basis and the tensor product is then, will then generate our multi-dimensional basis. So what we have in addition, yes, as numerical integration, of course, we use that spectral approach. Integration points are identical to the interpolation points. In time approximation, we have usually running explicit Runge Kuda scheme. We have also some IMAX approach. And of course, we have now, if we Yes, choose the degree of the polynomials, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's all possible. Yes, then we may run into problems at underresolved regions or even if we have shock waves in the simulation of compressible fluid flow. Yes, if we have a shock wave inside, a, let's say, a large element with a high order polynomials and of course we'll, we will have oscillations and we will have a problem with the increase of the amplitudes of these oscillations. <coughs> what we simply are doing, we introduce finite volume subcells. Yes, so that is our DG reference element. Yes, then we introduce, if we see that we have trouble DG cells so that we have oscillations. 
We can measure that, for instance, if we change our nodal basis to a modal hierarchical basis. Yes, so then we can look to the coefficients or if they will decrease. If not, or you can introduce some other oscillation or jump indicator. Yes, then we introduce the subcells. We calculate the integral means here. Yes, we reconstruct piecewise linear functions. So that's a second order DVD scheme. And then we solve on that subcells or our finite volume scheme. Yes, if we have the same number for the number of finite volume cells and decrease of freedom, then the structure of the solution is always the same. We can switch back and switch on. Yes, and Yes, you can interpret that uh, as a different evaluation of the volume integral. Yes, if you introduce a finite volume scheme, then you can look to the additional computational effort compared to the direct evaluation of the integral. That's about yes, uh, two times more computational effort. So you can look a little bit by your dynamic load balancing that you get then still an yeah, efficient simulation tool. Yes, I show you an example. That's a forward-facing step with a supersonic inflow. You see above the finite volume cells. Yes, and all others is done by the discontinuous galactic scheme. I think that's fifth or sixth order accuracy here. Yes, you also see the Calvin Helmholtz instability of the shear flow, and you see that you almost have no uh, finite volume cells here, so that, uh, yes, indicates, of course, also the inherent robustness of the discontinuous galactic. So that's now the table of all that uh, building blocks and uh, flexi code uh, that has been developed the last, let's say, 10 years is also available as an open source code on that web page. Uh, yes, I note that we can combine reconstruction and discontinuous galactic scheme also. Yes, so if we have a discontinuous Galerkin approximation of degree n, yes, then we can reconstruct that. That may be quite efficient because the neighbors are also polynomials, so you have a lot of information. Yes, and then you calculate, you can calculate the integrals or the fluxes mm, uh, much better, so you get a higher order accuracy. And you can fill up this table by these so-called PNPM schemes. You have here all the finite volume schemes where you have calculate integral means and reconstruct all other coefficients of the polynomial. You have here the pure DG schemes, yes, where you solve for all the coefficients of the polynomial polynomials and here in between you can fill up that by reconstructed discontinuous galactic schemes. Yeah, so if you have these basic building blocks, then you can even combine these in such yes, finite volume DG approaches. Now, I finished here the numerical methods. Now let's look to the coupling of heterogeneous regions. Now come on, let's come to the coupling problem, which is a basic topic, of course, here of the workshop. And I have an uh, example, maybe in error acoustics. If we have here a fluid flow around an airfoil, then of course we have to yeah, calculate to simulate the boundary layer. We may have uh, some separation, or we have 
of course the vortices at the railing edge that generates noise. Yes, so we need here the Navier-Stokes equations outside the obstacles, the viscous terms yes, are not so important, so we can change maybe to the Euler equations to calculate the second order derivatives really needs computational effort. Yes, especially if that is done in the discontinuous Galerking approach, so it would be nice to switch that off. Yes, and outside, if you are interested in the noise propagation, yeah, let's not say to the far field, that we cannot calculate in a time domain, but in the outer region, then you may even change from the nonlinear Euler equation to the linearized one. Yes, so we want to have subdomains with different equations, with different discretization methods. Of course, for the linearized Euler equation for acoustics, we can directly use DG without shock capturing. Yes, we want to change mesh sizes. Yes, here we have to calculate the small scale structure of the fluid flow and here outside, of course, the longer acoustic waves. And of course, it would be also nice to change the time steps. How to do that? Now, of course, the basic idea up to now that we were looking in was the Godunov's idea. Yes, also if we couple some heterogeneous or some different domains, then of course we introduce some jumps. Yes, so the idea is to use that you cannot take Taylor expansions. Yes, uh, but you have to introduce some discontinuities. So let's look to the Riemann problems. So. The example is coupling of the Euler equations, the nonlinear ones, of course, with the linearized Euler equations. Yes, so let's look to a one dimensional setting. Yes, so that may be normal direction. So we have for x smaller than zero the nonlinear equations, and for x, for x larger zero the linearized Euler equations. So, that's conservation equations, if we look to that as a, as a common system with a discontinuous flux. Yes, and the flux jumps at x equals zero. That is a difficult situation, but what can we do? First, we have to specify which solution we want. And of course, that's conservation equation, so the a physical argument would be that we have flux, the same fluxes from the right and left, yes, so that we guarantee the global conservation property. Yes, what we can do here with a discontinuous flux, for instance, we can shift that discontinuity to the dependent variables, we introduce in addition an equation for such a switching function. If we have a fixed position in space, then this would be the simplest equation. Yes, but we can also do that in a more generalized way. And then we look to the Riemann problem. Yes, s equal one then we have the Euler equations, and S equals zero, then we have the linearized Euler equations. Yes, now we have that shifted, enhanced to our system. We can now look to a linearized version, so we can apply the row method. Yes, and you see here the corresponding eigenvalues, so you now the Jacobian matrix is continuous, you can do all these things, yes, and you can look to the solution of the Riemann problem. Yeah, that's a local solution where you have the solution if the fluxes jump from one system to the other. Yes, you have an additional, let's say, wave 
That's of course also a linear degenerate one. Yes, here we have the jump from s equal 1 to s equal 0. Yes, and we can find a solution in such a way that here the corresponding jump conditions are valid and this gives us that the fluxes are the same. So the linearized Euler equations at u2 is equal to the nonlinear equation, the flux of the nonlinear equation at u1. Of course, that Riemann problem not always exists. You need an intersection of the Lex curves. You can consider that. There are also some theoretical considera considerations. Yes, so that maybe not exist. So it depends on the characteristics, of course. But the other question is, is this always a proper solution of the problem? Yes, and now let's look to that. We have done some calculations. So we have here the Euler equations. We have here introduced an interface to the linear oil, to the linearized Euler equations. Yes, you have a small jump in the velocities, in the wave propagation velocities. Yes, and we look uh, to do to do, to different coupling conditions, a sharp interface approximation based on that Riemann problem with a flux continuity, and we also smeared that a little bit out and looked what will happen. Now, what will happen? That's the reflected wave, but you have here a, another scale. Yes, so. The reflection is not a, a so difficult problem. You have an amplitude of 0.5%. So for the fluid flow, that will not so be an important thing. Yes, if you diffuse that, then you can reduce the amplitude, but you will end up by a broader width of that. Yes. So, but on the other hand, we can look what happens physically. And physically, it becomes clear. Yes, because we have a jump of our wave velocities. Yes, you can interpret that as different materials. And then you have reflection and breaking of the waves and you can uh, calculate the refraction indices and you can calculate the amplitude of the reflection. And the amplitude of the reflection is yes, now by the physical formula 0.5%. So that's very fine. Yes, so we obtain the same value so that we validates our results. Yeah, but in principle that's not the results that we really want because we introduce an artificial coupling in the phase, yes, and not a physical one. Yes, so it would be much better to look for a quite another solution. We want a solution not in such a way that we have here identical fluxes, but we want a smooth solution and maybe the fluxes are allowed to jump. Yes, the conservation property for the acoustic waves is not a big issue because we have nice smooth solutions. Yes, so we can neglect that and can look to a solution which is smooth. Yes, and how can we establish that? We can establish that if we take the initial value, UL, UR, Calculate the left Riemann problem, that's the pure nonlinear Euler equation with these data. This gives us a flux at x equals zero called g, numerical flux of the Euler equations. And we can calculate the right Riemann problem. Yes, so we solve the Riemann problem for the linearized Euler equations with the same initial data. Yes, and we obtain a flux for the linearized Euler equations. 
Yes, so we introduce some, um, or we calculate two Riemann problems, yes, and exchange directly the data. And then we can show that the solution that x equals zero and x equals zero is more continuous, and of course, the fluxes may jump. Now look to that situation. We even introduce different grids. Also, in that case, we have to be careful because if we have some yeah, parts in our solution which cannot resolve on the coarser grid, then this part is reflected. Yes, we have no chance to transport that yes, on a grid with a different resolution. So we have to filter out that, so we have to introduce again we have to modify the left state here and have to evaluate, for instance, here the approximate solution at the integration points and then to integrate here to, to average that solution to get a proper solution UL. You filter out the small scale structures that you cannot resolve here. And also vice versa, Yes, you need the order of accuracy here, so you have to reconstruct in a proper way, if you have a lower order method, to get a good state you are for the Euler equations. That's very important. Yes, and then you allow that the fluxes will jump, yes, because your numerical solution, your approximate solution should be a continuous one. Yes, so it's not longer, in that sense, uh, a proper physical solution. So if the conservation is important, if a shock wave crosses here, uh, uh, that uh, interface, of course, then you have to be careful. But if you look, for instance, for acoustics, yes, then it would be much better to have that in this way. Yes, now look what happens. That's really... The result, if we introduce a non-conservative coupling, yes, then we can reduce the 0.5% wave, the reflected wave, to nearly zero amplitude. Let's look to that. I directly starts. We change grids, uh, yes, as well, and you see a small reflection, which are uh, going back here at the interface at x equal 20. If you do that with the conservation of fluxes, it looks, uh, it looks worse. Yes, you see here uh, uh, different grids. Oh, it may be hardly to be seen. Yes, fine grids, and we also have finite volume methods, pure finite volume methods with reconstruction. And uh, of course, in the coarse grids, we have higher order accuracy. And if you move here that cone, and always we introduced that continuous coupling, then it looks quite good. Yes, so we need reconstruction if we want to go from coarse to fine or to from, from low order to higher order or we need integration and that is done evaluation of the polynomials at the gauss points of these let's say ghost cells yes in some sense that's a ghost fluid method or quite similar the ghost fluid method based on a local riemann problem solution so that's the conclusion of that coupling procedures. Of course, we need, when the conservation is important, to look at a weak solution of the Riemann problem with the Rankine-Igonio jump conditions. But if we look for a continuous solution, because we have some artificially introduced uh, in the phase, then it would be better to look for a continuous solution and to allow the fluxes that they have small jumps. 
So there are some papers also that look more to the uh, theoretical things of Gottlewski and co-workers. Uh, yes, and also some work with respect to more the applications. I will show some examples. The first example is directly a typical example for the interaction of such artificial coupling. Yes, so that is a yes work which was supported by the robot Bosch. Uh, by the Robert Bosch company, yes. So we have here in the hydraulic system some throttle and you will have here uh, cavitation, yes. And of course the cavitation is not a one-dimensional phenomena. That's really turbulence and three dimensions. But the cavitation clouds or bubbles will break down uh, yes, in, 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 in a short distance and then again you have a tube here and you want to calculate that in a one-dimensional way. Yes, and of course you have, you want to keep that very short, so you may have some, yes, movement into y and z direction, yes, in, in uh, not only into x directions and this you have to take out of the system because you cannot transport that in the tube, simulating that in a 1D way. Yes, so you need really in that case discontinuous fluxes. What we are doing, we introduce again such a switching variable and you see then the X and Y component of the momentum should drop out. So we jump from the three-dimensional region phi equal 1 to phi equal 0 in the one-dimensional one. Yes, and you see here such a coupling introducing ghost cells and uh, that is a test problem here because we have here two pulses, local pulses of the pressure but of course small ones. Yes, then of course that's a three-dimensional calculation. You will see three-dimensional effects or two-dimensional effects in that case, if that is plain. And uh, that is the coupling of three dimensions or two, di yeah, I think three dimensions to 1D simulation. And uh, yes, the aim is to have, yes, sm only small reflections at that point. Yes, and that works quite well if you allow that the fluxes are discontinuous. Of course, you become unphysical. Maybe you should look uh, what are the differences in the fluxes, yes, so that you have still a proper solution in the in real applications. So that's a simulation of coupling of Lexi with an heat transfer calculation, so we have an, yes, an, an, an cooling process here, a conjugate heat transfer. We couple uh, the Laplacian foam from open foam here with a flexi code and we are using precise in that way. So, yes, in that workshop I would of course show one example where we also use precise. Yes, uh, of course it was really good to have uh, such a relatively simple coupling and it was straightforward to apply that and couple to flexi. So I will show uh, another example here, uh, such a RANS, uh, such a zonal LAS approach, so we have a laminar flow over that airfoil, that is an airfoil for a wind blade, yes. Uh, so we couple the RANS simulation with the LES 
And of course, here we start, here we, we uh, a separation starts and we have the trailing edge noise and the turbulent flow. Yes, and the idea is here to switch to the LES. And of course, we have to generate You see it oh, a little bit small, but it uh, can be observed. Yes, here we generate fluctuations, and uh, then we have a high resolution and uh, apply the full flexi only with a subgrid scale model, and then you see the turbulent flow and all other background flow and the flow, yes, at the Top here is simulated by a Rens model. Yes, some about that generation of turbulence. That is a difficult task. What we apply is a so-called recycling. So we take the fluctuations <laughs> here and scale that again to the proper boundary layer profile and introduce these fluctuations here. Yes, and in addition, we introduce some source terms, yes? So we want to have as fast as possible a proper solution of the Navier-Stokes equations with a proper turbulence. While this is for the fluid flow perfect, so you have no problems, for the acoustics it's really difficult because to introduce source terms and to have no proper solution of the Navier-Stokes equations will generate time-dependent yeah, vortices and time-dependent a uh, flow that generates noise, yes, so uh, in aero acoustics where you are interested here in the noise generated by the trailing edge flow, uh, you have a, st a strong interaction with your numerical generated, numerically generated noise. Yes, so that's n up to now not satisfactory solved in, in our group. Yes, here's the forcing region. That's a comparison of the fluid flow that uh, is, uh, we compare with a fully LES around that airfoil and that uh, is quite good. Yes, so with respect to fluid flow, it's no problem. But if you look to aero acoustic, it's still a difficult thing. Yes, what we are trying is now to have some volumes that we recycle volumes and not only slices and hope that this will be a little bit, yeah, will make less noise than the other coupling here and the other way. So now I will show some, yes, let's say challenging simulations of the other groups at the Institute of Aerodynamics and Gas Dynamics. That's Thorsten Lutz. First, you will see here such a wind turbine. Yes, so that is calculated with flower. We have here and also some RANS modeling, SST. K, opsilla, uh, K omega turbulence model, yes, in that background. Then you have here, uh, uh, yes, grids around the blades that move with the blades. And uh, we have here also the structures model. So we have mm, fluid structure modeling here in, and the grids may move. So they are adapted by radial basis functions. And uh, in principle, flower is an uh, isn't structured uh, second order finite volume scheme, but we can also introduce on the regular grids and the fine grids a fifth order Venus scheme so that we get higher order accuracy and a better resolution of the vortices. Yes. 
you see 92 million grid cells or 9 million cells per blade for the fluid flow. You see here a simulation of fat. Yes, turbulence generator here before that tower and rotor and the turbulence intensity were 20%. That is a view on the blade here, yes, from the top, and the movement of the blade is visualized here in the right corner. Some things about the structure modeling that was based on SIMPAC. Yes, you have the Timoshenko beams for the blades, Bernoulli, Euler Bernoulli beam for the tower. Yes, and also the hub is um, and, uh, corresponding modeled. The nacelle is rigid. Yes, we have an explicit fluid structure coupling. Here we introduce currently some iterations, so that's more an implicit coupling. Uh, Yes, and what is interesting, of course, is the acoustic radiation of that wind turbine. You see here the acoustics at 100 meters. Yes, you have that plate passage frequency, and that's the highest amplitude. And in one kilometer away, then, of course, here that, yes, or oh, that frequency is not uh, the has not the most noise now, so we have some reduction of that. Yes, another simulation are the helicopter simulations of Manuel Kessler. Yes, and of course, such a helicopter is a very complex physical problem. Uh, fluid flow is considered as well as structure dynamics in direction with the fluid flow. And uh, yes, the geometry is as complex as possible. Yes, moving and deforming components. Let's look to some simulations. Also, the aerothermodynamics is considered if you have hot gas here from the turbines. And that's some new developments, yes, where you have a strong interaction between the different rotors, the volocopter. But we can also couple that with flight mechanics. Now I have to look, no. You there is some movie about that, stopping here that helicopter. Yes, so that is with coupling to the flight mechanics. And you already heard also the aeroacoustics of that flying helicopter. So now it goes away. Yes, now you know that we need a lot of computational effort on the supercomputer at Stuttgart. Yes, so let's go to the conclusions. I have shown you some yes, ideas about the coupling procedures that it might be quite good to allow discontinuities in the fluxes if you are really interested in the smoothness of the variables. And yes, thank you for your attention. Uh, golf balls, yes. <laughs> for us, yes. <laughs> Oh.
for the wind turbine that was done by uh, let's look that was a coupling with simpec yes so of course our fluid structure uh, though our main problem is here the fluid flow and uh, not so much the structure though uh, that's are often beams also i can show you here the simpec parameters so that's a structure so that's simply to take that program yes and you see that the different parts are yes modeled differently but uh, all 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 always relatively simple let's say i think so let's look due to the fact that these simulation have been done by torsten lutz i have to ask him uh, in in which way this is done Yes, but uh, Simpec uh, offers there several possibility. Yes, so I think that the coupling is mainly done by that Simpec. Hopefully. <laughs> Uh, I uh, yes, I, I think it's 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 very important, uh, of course, uh, that uh, we may have uh, different approximations in the different parts. Yes, so uh, in in that case, it is uh, we always or we often do that by hand. Yes, because we know very well our solution and. Uh, it's important uh, to have the same accuracy, the same resolution, otherwise you have to introduce some filtering or so. <coughs> yes, so... No, usually we do the da data mapping ourselves. Yeah. Yes, because that is of course a research code, yes, and uh, for instance, Flexi uh, offers that you can use every accuracy, yes, you say you want to have seventh order accuracy and so, and all this you should support then by a coupling or so, yes, so that's, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, uh, yeah. with the with the Navier-Stokes equations, with the nonlinear ones, you have to include all noise sources. Yes, and then of course, then you can get if you have the sources, you can change to the linearized Euler equations. Yes, so the source region should be included in the Navier-Stokes equations. And if you have uh, a mean flow field, then of course you can capture very well the influence of the fluid flow to the acoustics. Yes, you do not need longer small scale perturbations or fluctuations. Yes, so I think you can relatively yeah, have a, a very fast change to the linearized Euler equations. Uh, uh, for us up to now not, uh, because uh, yes, uh, our main applications are currently in the automotive industry with error acoustics also of my group and there we have a volume coupling 
Yes, so we have the volume data and we calculate then uh, the compressible Navier Stokes equation, in including all. Yes, look to the source terms and then we analyze then the acoustics. Yes, so we take the average flow field and uh, the noise sources and can then look how the noise will propagate. Yes. Yes, of course, that's uh, a problem. But uh, of course, you have to introduce that discontinuous fluxes in that case. Yes. So if you have outside a coarser grid or higher order accuracy, then you have to look to the resolution, yes, and you have to filter out in your data which are transferred uh, these frequencies of these wavelengths. Yes, that's the only chance to get no reflections. Thank you.